Welcome to Good. Free whoop. Welcome to Free Kiwis. We're very pleased today to be joined by Dr. David Lillis. Uh, David has had a career in many different aspects of science policy. He's worked with data uh, in different capacities. So he's worked for the Foundation for Research, Science and Technology, for the Correct. Royal Society yep. Te Aparanga, and yep. for NZQA, where I met him oh, nigh on 20 years ago now. And after that, he became academic manager at the uh, New Zealand Institute for Sport. And now I believe, David, you are a gentleman scholar, is that right? Well, I don't know whether you describe me as either, but I am definitely retired. I've been retired for four and a bit years. Um, so thank you for that introduction, Michael. Shall I take it away or do you want to continue with? This? Well, I think we'll, we'll have a conversation about a few things. And, and perhaps the yeah. first thing uh, you had wanted to discuss was a paper that was recently published about the relative representation of Māori scholars in universities. Is that is that, yeah. have I got yeah. that right? Yeah, I think that that's, that's correct. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, there's so many different aspects to all of this, and I don't know exactly where to start. But what I, my, I, I guess that uh, one place to start is to note, um, you know, uh, allegations of systemic bias and racism in our universities. And so is, perhaps uh, before we come on to that, it'd be yeah. worth, worth just starting to let listeners know what the issue is. So yeah, the, yeah. these authors have raised the issue that, Māori have a smaller proportion of places in universities, especially in professorships and in the higher echelons of academia, than their representation in the general population. Is, is that about... Yeah, th that's, uh, co yeah. that's correct. And there's a, a number of papers that I've reviewed recently. And, you know, to be honest, I've tried to keep an open eye, an open view on this. And when I began to read around the subject, I thought, well, maybe there really is a, a very serious problem here. So the, the and, problem uh, that they're, they're alleging is that the reason that for this low representation is a built-in racism or a structural racism in, in the university system. Is that? Is yeah, that... That, that, that's correct. And so uh, a number of papers have come out and uh, have been accepted with, within the academic community in a way that I feel they should not be. And a number of them have emerged from a small group of people uh, that include Tara McAllister and a few others, um, Joanna Kidman and so forth. Now, now my take on this... Uh, David, sorry, I'll, sorry I'll to um, st keep interrupting you. I feel yeah, like we're interrupting I, you a lot, but I, I just want to get all this prefacing uh, uh, at the very beginning. Yeah. And I'm actually going to post links to these papers because I've actually written them down in my notes, so we might as well yeah. just say. So there's a 2019 yeah. paper in yeah. Why, a New Zealand Journal of Indigenous Scholarship, that's the name of the journal, why That's isn't correct. my professor Maori? That's by McAllister, Kidman, Rowley, and Theodore. And correct, I think you're yeah. also going to talk about a paper called Glass Ceilings in New Zealand Universities, which is about Maori and Pacifica representation. 2020, yeah. that paper is, also appeared in my New Zealand Journal of Indigenous Scholarship by correct. McAllister, uh, Kokawa, Naipi, Kidman, and Theodore. And then you've just come out with uh, an article, a lengthy uh, article, but not an academic journal article, a very detailed one in Breaking Views, is posted on Breaking Views, and yeah, that's called correct. Allegations of Racism in New Zealand Unity. So <clears throat> we're going to post all of those articles at the end. So sorry, just to, th right. that's the last right. prefacing. <laughs> okay, well, look, um, you know, I, I do believe that this sort of research that this group has undertaken is very valuable research. And people like these can act as the critic and conscience of our university system and other, other systems as well, our education system. But I think with this kind of work, you've got to be very careful. You've got to you've got to be measured and balanced in your allegations. And so, you know, there's a number of papers here that I've reviewed. Uh, there's one here, 50 reasons why there are no Maori in your science department. Oh, dear. I, I do think that the author of that paper ought to have a really good look at that paper and look at herself in the mirror and ask herself whether she's done the right thing by making allegations of the kind that she has and actually naming individuals, you know, academics. Without naming it, any it, individuals, it, it, what what, no. what kind of allegations is she making? Okay, well, if you actually look at this paper, and I don't want to spend time on this one because I want to get onto the other ones, but, you know, in relation to the, the seven professors and the letter to the listeners, she regards what was said by the professors as a blatantly racist attack, racist attack on Matharanga and... and an attack on her very existence. 
But you see, then she says 50 reasons why there are no Maori in your science department because of a group of people who are named. And I think, you know, you can be very careful with that kind of thing. I regard it, and as I said, I really want to get onto the other papers rather than focus on this one. It's okay. I, we can actually talk about this one for a while because I've also printed it out. Yeah. Uh, I've got a couple of things to say. But um, yeah, so, uh, so uh, the, the, reg- the people yeah. she's talking about in the, in the number one that you've mentioned, yeah. just to make clear, uh, are the signatories to a letter to the Listener magazine in New Zealand, That's which correct. was called In Defense of Science. And so they were trying to defend science against what they perceived as attacks against it as being sort of inherently bound up with imperialism. And there was then a huge reaction against this, partly from academic colleagues, partly from institutions like the Royal Society. And so she has yeah. sort of continued this critique, if you would want to call it that. Although the, the actual uh, number one of 50 reasons why there are no Maori in your science department, it just says because of the seven signatories by their first names, it doesn't actually criticize their ideas in any sense. So I didn't really see where the force of that argument was. But okay, go on. What, what else does she well, have to say? Well, she's giving those individual people, these are well-known professors, uh, as reasons why there are no Māori in your science department. And that, and that is, and also because of racism. Now, you know, when minorities raise these issues, it behoves us to consider them very carefully. There could be pockets of racism here and there in many sectors, including our tertiary sector. Uh, but I believe you've got to be very careful about naming individuals in a publication like that. And uh, I regard it as below the belt. However, I don't, I'll let you say whatever you want to say about it, because I, I really want to focus on one or two other papers in particular. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, I think I know yeah. what you want to do. I want to do that, too, because I think the other papers are much better. It's just that, um, I mean, I'll be blunt. Like, I think this is a pretty astonishing example of where academia has gotten in some quarters i don't think it's typical there are a lot of academics who do extremely good work extremely complicated work you know they control for things statistically in fact some of these uh, the, mcallister herself is part of a team that does some of those proper things in, in in other papers even though we'll we'll have some criticisms of those papers too but this one it, it, the the core of this article is literally a list of 50 supposed reasons why right. there are no maori in your science department and many of them clearly facetious right They're well yeah i think that's right it's hard to gauge the tone of this i mean it's in an academic journal right it's in the what's your journal of global indigeneity so maybe it's a kind of piece of performance poetry but in that case i just wonder you know how appropriate that is would that have been tolerated if she had different views than the one she has you know i think these are all open questions perhaps it's worth just reading out a few of the reasons so read uh, so yeah. listeners can get an idea of what we're talking about so number one uh david is always already sort of mentioned it just names the list of signatories and it says it's because of them that there are no maori in your science department but that itself is actually even if it's sort of tongue-in-cheek it's quite a strong claim to make that because of these seven individuals you know there are no maori and as if they directly kind of intervene to exclude maori well well, there's no evidence for that as far as i know right Uh, number three is because your department is full of dusty dinosaurs who don't believe our tipuna new science like we navigated across the biggest ocean without science um, there, actually, in the second sentence, there is uh, a fair argument that, you know, maybe the Polynesian, Polynesian navigators could be said to have had science, but it isn't unpacked, and it's really unnecessary, I think, to call people dusty dinosaurs. Uh, number 17, uh, uh, this reason 17, or supposed reason 17, because why would we want to work our, our arses off in your department, tick all your white boxes, do unpaid cultural labor at the flick of a wrist, speak on behalf of all the Maoris, spelt M A. O W R I E S, and sacrifice our own Hawara when Nigel, who is the epitome of white male meritocracy, still gets promoted and paid more than us. Nigel hasn't published a paper in two years, and students fall asleep as he, is, as he monotonic, monotonically lectures them with outdated material that, like Nigel, is way past its use by date. Or uh, Nigel, eh? Yeah, I want to stick up for uh, lecturing in a monotonic style because I've done that for 10 years now and I've been very successful. But ag- again, I, I don't really see why that's reason i mean has she controlled for people called nigel or this particular nigel you know has she actually made any effort to figure out what the effect of nigel lecturing monotonically is on the number of maori in the science department um number 18 is because your white discipline attempts to control us change uh change the line contain us change paragraph limit us change paragraph discipline us not sure why the changing of paragraphs has any force And then 34 is similar, because your department is an anxious, bullying, colonial, dangerous, ego-driven, fucked up, gloomy, hurtful, isolating, juvenile, knavish, lonely, monstrous, nauseating, offensive, painful, questionable, racist, sexist, tiresome, unbalanced, venomous, warlike, xenophobic, yucky zoo. And so there she's she's chosen one article, uh, sorry, one item 
her uh, uh, letter of the alphabet, which is sort of, again, I think it's sort of interesting as, well, maybe sort of interesting as scholarly po- stuff. Poetry, but it's scholarly not. Scholarly stuff. It's not. It's not a scholarly <laughs> article. And I, I do think, you know, we can, we can make allowances that maybe this is partly a, a sort of comic piece, but it, it is worth pointing out that this is published in a journal, Journal of Global Indigeneity, and when it comes to promotion and uh, scholarly esteem and things like that w- within the university administration, this counts as a journal article, right? So this is really the point that um, James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose were trying to make with their uh, spoof articles. You know, they wrote these deliberately kind of broken, um, nonsensical articles, and they got them published in, in various fields, including, I think, indigenous studies, so I'd have to double check that. And so for me, I mean, it's fine to write a kind of piece of performance poetry or satire. You know, we do a bit of that in the initiative satire. But um, yeah, it's just very strange to me that this is the kind of thing that might get you promotion. Anyway, so that's the one McAllister article. And maybe you want to add a few things on this one, David. But I will add at the end there that I think that the other articles that she co-authored are much better. So I do want to add that too. But yeah, did yeah. you want to add something on this on this article? No, nothing in particular. I just think that naming individuals in a, in a pejorative manner in in a public forum such as a a, a a journal, you know, article. I think that's the wrong thing to do, quite frankly. Yeah. And impugning people to to in with a suggestion that in fact they are racist or have harmed minorities in some way. When but, without being haven't. specific about how. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And really, this is not scholarly argument it's not how we advance ideas it's not how we actually have a productive debate it's just Correct. it's just essentially name calling it is yes indeed and allegations of racism well like you can you can uh, you can allege racism or systemic bias but actually proving it is a bit more difficult and of course we do hear minorities talking about isolation on campus and feelings of, of negativity within a, a white dominated uh, campus and so forth those things are understood and when yeah. we hear when we hear you know anecdotal evidence i think it behoves us to listen very carefully yeah, well, let, re- let, re- yeah let's give that idea its due I, I mean i do think that feelings of isolation are common amongst students on campuses uh, mm. perhaps of any ethnicity but you can certainly understand that if you don't see many people like you uh, and yeah. maybe from your background whether that is your socioeconomic background or your ethnic background it's, it could be easy to get the idea that university isn't really a place for you. And, and so there is a, a valid point to make there, but surely it's not made helpfully in this kind of uh, vitriolic and, and hyperbolic manner. Uh, absolutely, I agree with that. And there's a causal link there. Uh, if there, are, there is isolation or if there are clear disparities in percentages uh, uh, you know, in employment on on university faculties, just uh, differences uh, in, in employment across ethnicities, and that therefore there must have been systemic bias and racism. I mean, that's a, a very big leap to make, and this is what I'd really like to discuss. Right, right. Relation. So that's actually a really good link to what I was going to yeah. ask next. So in that 2019 paper by McAllister and her colleagues, why yeah. isn't my yeah. professor Maori, which I think we agree is a much better paper. Uh, yeah. That paper concludes that, and I quote, Maori academics were severely underrepresented at universities between 2012 and 2017, comprising approximately 5% of the workforce. So I think that's actually from the abstract. But the claim there seems to be that Maori academics were underrepresented at New Zealand universities in this period because they only comprise 5% of the workforce, and they're actually, what, 16% of the population. So what do you, Correct, you, think, yeah. what do you think of that claim, David? Well, I mean, on the surface of it, it sounds logical. And and you can ask some pretty good questions as to why this is the case. Why if if Maori or people who self-identify as Maori, apart Maori, (coughs) do indeed constitute 16% of the total population, while we only have approximately 5% of the total workforce, why is it? Now, I suspect that it has to do with things that happened in their lives before then at secondary education. But also other factors might be at play in terms, uh, including personal choice. Uh, now, yeah. this, this is this is where we come to the glass ceilings in New Zealand uh, universities paper. This is published in the same journal in 2020. Um, and so I thought to myself, well, is it really appropriate to use that denominator, the 16 percent 
who self-identify as Maori, part Maori in the population, uh, in, in terms of your basis for comparison. What I did then is to look at um, back data from the Ministry of Education on PhD completions historically, going back to say 1998. And I thought to myself, well, look, who are these professors? Who are the people who are applying for promotion into the professoriate today or from, you know, from 2018 or 19 right through to today? Uh, and of course, the pool of interest here is not the 16%, but actually a much smaller pool of people who completed a PhD uh, sometime in the past, let's say between 1998 and 2008, because that group of people, or a little bit before then, are the people who are now applying to go into the professoriate. And what I found when I downloaded the data and did a little bit of Excel calculations and looked at percentages, I found that between 1998 and 2008, that 10-year uh, purview, um, approximately 4.6% of all PhD completions went to people self-identifying as Maori. That's nothing like the 16%. So when you use the 16% as your denominator, you're greatly inflating a, a perceived problem. So what you actually found is that the, um, the proportion of PhDs going to Maori is fairly similar to the proportion of academic positions held by Maori. That is exactly correct. If you look back at that 10 year purview, and you could go further back and yes. a little bit more recently, of course, of get course, more or less the same value, but the same uh, per uh, percentages. Of course, it could be argued, and this may or may not have to do anything with anything to do with universities themselves, that the fact that uh, a higher proportion of PhDs aren't going to Māori is part of the, this problem. And you mentioned before that you think that uh, the these issues have something to do with secondary school. I, I mean, I would say they have to do with a great deal more than secondary school. They have yep, to do with yep. primary school as well. And, and in fact, yep. uh, how children are prepared when they come into primary school. And we know that there is a big socioeconomic gradient in preparation for formal education, which may or may not have anything to do with race as such. We do know, regrettably, in New Zealand that Māori and Pacifica people are overrepresented in poverty statistics, uh, and I think it's there's a very fair case to make that that is itself a legacy of historical racism, at least if if not contemporary racism. Uh, yeah. I don't yeah. I don't think there's really uh, much of a ground to argue against that. Uh, I think you can point to a lot of things in New Zealand's history that have led to Māori people being impoverished in proportions uh, much greater than than other groups but um, to lay it at the door of you know Nigel and and so on uh, seems a little simplistic I would say it's more than simplistic and um, I agree that historic racism and, and systemic bias uh, in many you know, colonial countries or countries that have been dominated by Eurocentric thinking and, and European people. There has been a lot of this kind of stuff, but we've we've moved on from this, uh, and the world is a different place. So, do all disparities in the in the present arise from you know injustice in the present? Well, that's a, a very difficult question. But you see, now that the use of that denominator, the sixteen percent denominator, is but one problem in this uh, in this paper. Uh, it's it's a wrong denominator. There is also, in my view, a philosophical and conceptual problem where you begin with a supposition of bias and racism and then seem to work your way backwards to demonstrate the truth of this. But that's not the way good research works. Re good research uh, involves an investigation of the environment of interest, uh, evolving findings on the basis of robust techniques and, and methods, and then discussing possible rationales, possible factors and causes that account for those findings uh, in relation to maybe other alternative causes. This is not what's, what's happened in any of these papers. It's uh, presuming an issue, a, a, a cause and then working retrospectively to demonstrate it. Right. This, this is the so-called uh, motivated reasoning. I think yeah, to, some ex to some extent yeah. we all engage in this, right, that we have our assumptions it's a we, well-known human we bias have a, all a subconscious tendency to sort of yeah, it's, it is not the, for, uh, it is not forgivable in a researcher 
no researcher right, worth right. his or her salt engages in that kind of motivational reason. Well, I mean, I think but, that there's an argument that, um, you know, in a proper university context or a proper set of academic and intellectual institutions that are working properly, that can be um, counteracted to some extent by having people of different views, each, yeah. you know, conducting this kind of motivated reasoning. So, that, you know, the people who are more have more of a tendency to think that there is racism in the university system can write papers like this where they maybe look for evidence for that. And actually, I don't think that's illegitimate as long as they're not, you know, making things up, which I don't think these researchers are. And then the people who uh, have a tendency to be skeptical of that claim can weigh in. And I think one of the real problems now in New Zealand and perhaps elsewhere is that it's, it's much more difficult for the people who are skeptical of these claims to get their views out there. And I mean, I think uh, I would include us in that and maybe you. I mean, breaking views is not as prestigious an outlet as uh, some of these academic journals are, but I think your article is, is just as um, rigorous. But l let me pick that up this. It may be read by more people. Though. It may be read by more people. But it's not, I mean, it wouldn't go on your list of publications as an academic, as an as a academic journal article would. L let me pick up, David, one other discrete argument that you make or discrete claim that you doubt. So the researchers in both these articles claim that they're controlling for age. Sorry, I should say the researchers in the glass ceiling article which is yeah. about the number of Maori who may, and Pacific researchers who make it to the title of professor, which is the sort of top, uh, the upper echelon of academic uh, achievement in, ter in terms yeah. of the academic career threshold. And they claim that they control for age. In other words, they're saying that even when Maori and Pacifica scholars are in their 50s and 60s, the kind of age that you might become a professor, they're less likely to become a professor than others. So do you think that age is actually the appropriate uh, variable here? Yeah, well, absolutely not. Other things being equal, it ought to be. <clears throat> but in their own papers, uh, and at least a couple of them, Wise and my Professor Murray and in the Glass Ceilings, they make it very clear that the average age of a Maori PhD student is 49 years. Now, there's no slur on that. There's no negative connotation here because people have different life histories and trajectories and objectives. But the average age for completion of a PhD overall is about 31. So if an average, the average age of a Maori PhD student is 49, typically they might be getting their PhDs at about 51. There's a 20 year delay. And surely that must account for some of the, the variance that we're seeing in these disparities. Right, because I but, guess if you if you only get your, let's try, try and think this through just to make it really ex explicit yeah. and clear. If you only, I got my PhD at 30 and then I started as a junior lecturer, then I made it to senior lecture and here I am, I'm still a senior lecturer. But anyway, um, uh, the idea is that you can, you can move up and it takes sort of maybe five or 10 years each time, maybe more than that to move up a step. So if you get your PhD at 50, again, I agree, there's no stigma on that. You know, maybe you're doing something more interesting before, but imagine mm -hmm. you get your PhD at 50, then you start, you get an entry level position in academia, you're a junior lecturer. Yeah. It's going to take five or 10 years, right? And then you're 60. Okay, then. To, to give read, uh, listeners some idea, I mean, I think a 10 year delay between getting a PhD and becoming a full professor would be meteoric. It's I mean, almost that, unheard of. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's going to be more like 15 uh, at best. So if you get your PhD at 50, you're at retirement age by the time you get to be at that level of seniority, yeah. probably. That's right. So uh, let's pick up on one other th interesting thing in the articles, one other measure that they try and control for, which is research performance. So because, of course, we might assume that people who produce more research and better research uh, you know, should get the, the better jobs and should ascend up the academic uh, hierarchy more quickly. So in these articles, they use PBRF as a measure of research performance. So can you maybe explain to our listeners who are outside of academia what PBRF is and why it's a measure of research performance, but might not be the best measure of research performance? Oh, well, I mean, the, the, pub, the Performance Based Research Fund was in evolution when I was working in research evaluation all those years ago in the late 1990s. And uh, I remember the work that was ongoing and developing it. So it came online approximately 2020, 2002. And at the moment, something like $315 million is dispersed to tertiary uh, institutions uh, on the basis of the, mostly of their research performance and individual researchers submit portfolios of the research work and money is dispersed to these institutions on the basis of overall performance of individual researchers. Now, look, each researcher is assigned a score. Uh, I can't comment on the validity of the scores. I do know a number of academics who don't 
um, have much faith in those scores, but I don't. I, it's not my place to comment. I simply don't know. But um, so you've got in this glass ceilings paper, um, uh, first of all, the use of a wrong denominator, then the misuse of age as a covariate, as a, 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 a controlling for age, which is incorrect. Uh, look, I won't comment on the use of PBR for ratings. Um, they also control for field, but we don't know the distribution of, of people of different ethnicities working in different fields. Well, David, we need to me, know, um, know more about that. I, I would actually like to comment on the use of PBRF because I think uh, these two articles, not the first one we discussed, but the other two are actually quite good articles. And I can understand why they use PBRF as a research measure because yeah. it's very convenient. They have all the data sure. and they can actually look at the whole set of academics in New Zealand. I think that's, that's an important point. I, I mean, you might think of more refined measures like citation rates, but you just couldn't gather the data on on the population of academics. Yeah, yeah. but here's yeah. the thing. I mean, I think that PBRF captures, as it were, one slice of research performance, but not all of it. So, um, yeah, just to give listeners an idea, I mean, I had to do this a few years ago, You and I'm sure Michael has had to as well. You know, I you have. get all your publications together, and you sort of write up all the things you've been doing in the past few years, including service, administration. But the main part of it, the core of the PBRF, is that you select four outputs, okay? Maybe a book, an article, you know, maybe four articles if you're really confident in your articles and you haven't produced a book. I mean, that, that's what I did. I, I had four articles. Depends and then, on the discipline. Depends on the discipline. And then someone someone else in your discipline uh, will, or a committee from other people in your discipline, will assess those outputs as the, as the core process in the PBRF. And they will then assign a grade to how influential and how good, basically. They'll, they'll do some measure of quality of the of this research output now the the reason so that I, I, as i say i don't think it's a nonsensical way of looking at research no, performance i'm no, just saying that in the in these papers uh, what often happens is that they say look there are some people who've been promoted to professor even though their pbrf scores aren't that good and there are other people who have amazing pbrf scores but they haven't gone so far and i think the problem there is just that there may be other measures of research performance that are much more tightly linked to progression up the academic pay scale so, for example, PBRF, if the core part of it is just putting four research outputs into the assessment, exactly. then it doesn't actually measure the total number of outputs that you've produced. And, I, uh, and uh, my experience in promotion uh, is that within the New Zealand academic system is that actually for promotion, they do care about quality and the uh, prestige of the journals you're publishing in. But overwhelmingly, I think they, they care about the number of outputs. And it's people who get to professor tend to have lots and lots of outputs. Well, also, the other point is that in promotion they, they take teaching seriously. Now historically it hasn't been taken nearly as seriously as publication but I, I think that has started to change and so sometimes it may be appropriate that somebody with not such a stellar research record but an outstanding teaching record gets promoted. Yeah and, and well, well I'll, I'll just finish the last thing so I want to say yeah. about PBR, the PBRF issue because I think it's an important one because actually David, you, uh, you've helped me understand something that I had a sort of suspicion about before, which is a few years ago, I read another article. I should make clear this is another a excellent article. It uses data, it controls for various things, unlike the first paper by McAllister that we read and, and some other work in this field. But it, this is a really good article. It's called um, Research Performance and Age Explain Less Than Half of the Gender Pay Gap in New Zealand Universities by Brower and James. And I'll put a link to that. That's in PLOS One. It was published in PLOS One in 2020. And you can just see in the title, it's very interesting that they used, again, research performance, by which they actually mean, if you read the article, PBRF, they use PBRF mm -hmm. again, yep. and age. So again, they used age and they said, these two things, PBRF performance and age, they're not explaining much of the reason for why men get paid more than women. And I actually should point out as well that I would like to say that I, I had an exchange with Brower and James on Twitter about this, and I put this point to them and they were very gracious and they... I want to go to my way to say, to thank them for being civil on Twitter because you know it should be par for the course with academics, but of course nowadays, especially on on Twitter, it isn't. But I think that they they agreed that um, some amount of the difference in pay between men and women at universities might be accounted for by uh, the number of outputs and other things like that. Which of course doesn't mean that you can't talk about that or complain about that or think that that's sexist, but it's. It's a little bit of a different conclusion than if you just look at PBRF and age. So that's really the point I wanted to to pick up from your papers. Well, just yeah, on that I, on that point about the the gender pay gap more generally, I, I've done a bit of work on this for a book I've been writing, and it seems internationally, and I can't I can't speak about academia in particular, 
but the uh, pay gap in general is heavily driven by the fact that women, more than men, tend to drop out of the workforce for a few years to look after children. And that that is largely the biggest explanation for the the gap in pay between men and women. Yeah, and I've mentioned this, Michael, in that paper. I don't know whether you saw that part of it. It might, it might be in the in appendices at the end. But there's a, there's a point I want to make here. Um, you know, a pa- paper such as this glass ceilings paper um, m- might it might do, and others like it, might influence decision-making on systemic changes of the kind that we've been seeing in New Zealand. Systemic changes within our university system, within education, uh, and within science funding as well. So it behoves us to get this sort of stuff right and to challenge it where we think it actually isn't fair. And I think the stuff isn't fair. And I want to make a comment here that I've, I've spoken to many academics at universities across the country And they say that the academic promotions committee exercises are very robust. They are superintended by human resources people whose task it is to ensure fairness and objectivity, ensure there is no hint of bias, and also that there is is no declaration of ethnicity uh, in these processes. So I'm surprised that the university system hasn't attempted, the, the administrations within universities haven't attempted to defend themselves more against these allegations on this basis, that in fact, the processes are pretty robust. Yeah, well, I think the, the fact they haven't defended themselves, I mean, I think that speaks to the, the reason that we started this podcast really is that in New Zealand, as in other Anglophone countries, there's this pall of fear that's descended uh, yeah. talking around certain about certain issues uh, especially yep. anything that deals with race, and so yeah, I'm not entirely surprised. But you know, we can have a conversation here. So let's well, just well, even that. even if you do front up with compelling evidence for a particular phenomenon, uh, a difference perhaps between eth- ethnic groups in in something like university promotions or whatever it might be, if if you front up with evidence, it doesn't actually protect you against claims of racism and being shouted down. So. It actually comes as no surprise at all to me to find that universities are reluctant to defend themselves against these claims because well, to do so would be to open the door to that kind of allegation. Well, I, I don't have any time for that at all. There should be a level playing field and it behoves every one of us, regardless of who we are, our ethnicity or our background, to, to be fair and objective in our assertions and in our worldview, particularly if we put those worldviews and our assertions into the public domain. Uh, so I think that the universities have been remiss in, 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 this, in this area, just as I believe that in New Zealand we are remiss in what we are doing in, sec- in the primary and secondary education field. And this is another conversation that maybe we'll get into in just a moment. Well, we can do that. We can do that now, I guess. Yeah. Because I know you you wanted to talk about curricular issues, and Michael has a big interest in yeah. that too. I, so I do. I'll... And one observation I'd make here is that I I, I think there is a form of racism at work in our system, or at least it effectively works out that way uh, through the socioeconomic strata of our school system. So this is until what recently was the decile system. Uh, yeah. for, for listeners who don't know, the decile system is is a way of allocating more funds to schools that serve poorer communities. So schools were rated according to the concentration of poverty in their zones and given extra funding accordingly. It was an imperfect system and it's recently been replaced with something called the equity index, which is targeted at the individual level, a better way of doing it, but it it amounts to the same thing. Now, the thing is that when you look at our national qualification system for young people, which you're as familiar with as I am, David, since we worked on it together at NZQA, what you see is that the because it's such a flexible system where you can assess young people in disciplines like science and mathematics and history and English, you can also assess them in things like occupational health and safety and even some very low-level assessments really targeted towards people with special educational needs. Uh, Those credits are open to everybody. And so there are high roads and low roads to uh, NCEA. And there's some very good research out of a, a... a research group called Star Path 
that showed that especially Pacifica kids, and I'd be astonished if it didn't apply to Māori as well, were being given systematically poorer offerings when it came to the standards that they were assessed for for NCEA. So that would be a good place to start if we wanted to address the under-representation of Māori and Pacifica at university in general, because you have to get certain credits to even get into university, yeah. let alone to get to PhD level and so on. So there are, I, I think there are structural things within the... Well, actually, is it structural? Maybe not, uh, but it's certainly choices that are made on the ground in schools that can assume certain things about people on the basis of either their socioeconomic status or their ethnicity. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you on that. And uh, I do remember, it, Michael, when I first arrived at NZQA as a statistician working with you, we had many discussions about how it is and why it is that some ethnicities and some demographic groups perform less well than others. And this the the majority of research studies suggest that socioeconomics is a very great predictor, probably the predominant predictor. I don't know whether you know, but I remember doing this at NZQA. I remember downloading an enormous volume of data and fitting a regression model, multiple regression model, and uh, arriving at the conclusion that indeed socioeconomics are the main predictor. They may not be the only predictor. There could be other factors in there. But that's where we've got to start, as well as looking at families and uh, and so forth, uh, what's going on within families in, in the low deciles and, and thereabouts. But getting back, Michael and James, to the curriculum. Uh, now, Michael, I haven't discussed the curriculum with you at the, uh, as yet, but the refresh of the curriculum worries me very greatly. Um, I personally believe that this is a, a serious accident waiting to happen in the future. The curriculum refresh, as it, as it is configured at the moment, uh, is very heavily treaty centric. And, and of itself, I've got no problem with that, provided we remember that New Zealand is not a bicultural society, a Pakeha and Maori. New Zealand is a multicultural society where, in fact, if you total up non Maori and non European people, all the others, the Asian people of our country and the uh, Pacific people of our country and, and others from North Africa and the Middle East, Muslim people and uh, others from South America and so on. Those people total very nearly 10 percentage points in the population more than self-identifying Maori. And yet we wouldn't ever know that and we, when we read the, the various documentation that sits around the curriculum. So, so let's get a bit more specific on what the curriculum refresh is trying to do. I mean, I think one thing when I looked at it that I was cautiously pleased about it offers a bit more detail on things like literacy and numeracy in in yeah. primary school so we can give it a small tick for that I, I think it could do a lot better uh, I must say I don't think it goes far enough in that regard but I suspect what you're alluding to is the intention to infuse every discipline with Mataranga Māori the the Māori cultural knowledge is, is that what I'm... that that is one of the main things and Michael look you're, an, you're one of the foremost thinkers in education in, uh, in New Zealand. You would know the detail better than me, but but I, I did look recently at the PISA uh, performance of New Zealand, uh, and we have been trending downwards very, very rapidly over the last 20 to 25 years. 25 years ago, 20 years ago, we are well above the, the means for the OECD in science, in mathematics and literacy and reading and all these things. And we've been trending downhill at quite a rapid rate over this last 20 to 25 years. We have. Is this, is this really the time to throw in any form? I'm not complaining about Matamaranga Maori in particular, but any form of traditional knowledge and embed it right across the curriculum in absolutely every single learning area. I, I, I cannot for the life of me see this is a good thing. And, you know, I recently got to know a, a bunch of people at some of our local mosques. They are concerned about education. They reminded me that we are a, a multicultural nation. And I, you know, I believe that uh, those people who are behind this curriculum refresh, and you've got people like many Panahira, Graham Smith and Vaughan Bidwa and many others, those people ought to go on a, on a tour around this country, visit every mosque 
in this in this country visits all of the main uh, Pacifica communities and the Asian communities and provide a compelling set of reasons as to why their kids ought to imbibe one form of traditional knowledge as truth and why it should be embedded right across every single learning area. Well, well I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I suspect what they'd say is that uh, the treaty established a partnership between Māori and the Crown and the principles of that partnership are that we should give equal status to Māori knowledge and you know what they might call Western knowledge or colonial knowledge. So I think that would be their argument. I, I personally... Well, I've re reread the treaty many times over, and I, for the life of me, maybe I'm missing something. I don't see the word partner or partnership anywhere there. Yeah, so I have, I've had the same experience as someone who's only been here 10 years, but I, I think that um, they would refer back to the legal judgments at the end of the 80s that seem to have set up this idea of the principles of the treaty. So there's a, I think the, their claim is that there's a sort of principle of partnership in the treaty, but that, of course, depends on a certain interpretation that was done by so, a set of judges, you know, at that particular period. So I don't know if I share that. So let's be, let's be charitable here, though, and say perhaps, you know, there should be room in our curriculum for Māori knowledge. Uh, Agreed, absolutely, yes. And, and that it could be represented in its own right, and maybe that would be yeah. a more respectful way to represent it than attempting to fuse it with epistemic systems like science where really there, there isn't I, I mean to go back to that question about whether the Polynesian navigators had science behind them when they crossed the Pacific I mean to some extent it becomes an argument about the meaning of a word doesn't it what what do we mean by science and my, my personal take is that this whole debate which could have been much more productive than it has been uh, is in part unproductive because people don't agree on what they mean by the word science. I would agree with that and of course uh, we haven't maybe finished on our, our, our discussion of the curriculum. No, no, we can. Uh, but, 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 I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I took degrees in physics, and I don't recall anyone telling me that there was a life force in all inanimate things. But I mean, again, is this going to improve, or will it actually cause damage to education? And I think it's going to cause damage. Whatever the treaty said 180 years ago, yes, we take all that on board. But in 2023. Do we not have duty of care to every child attending early childhood and primary and secondary education in New Zealand, irrespective of ethnic background or colour or creed or country of origin? And I, I believe that we, we're going to do damage in this regard. And I don't know what your, your view on, on that is, uh, uh, Michael, but... Um, well, I, I have to say, from an educational perspective, I agree with you. I, I, I don't think that we can coherently teach either science or Mataranga Māori if we insist on treating them as one and the same thing. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I think that there, there might be some overlap in the sense that, um, you know, Indigenous peoples are quite good at uh, identifying certain types of plants which are useful and or harmful. And so there are probably things that are known about flora and fauna in New Zealand Yes. That come from Aturanga Māori. And I don't mind Certainly. integrating that into biology classes or geography classes. Although to me, that's just, it's very similar to, you know, Newton happens to have discovered calculus or Leibniz if you're German. And, you know, other people in France discovered certain things and people in Holland and China discovered right. certain things. And, um, and that's fine, but that's just all these different contributions that go into science, right? And then, so I would say you can use that empirical stuff in a science class, but then this is why I prefer to uh, translate or, you know, use the phrase um, Maori traditional lore when I talk of Maturanga Maori, because it seems to me that even by the Royal Society's own definition of Maturanga Maori, it includes all these elements which are which are plainly non-empirical, right? So the stuff about Maori, yep. the life spirit, and also the yep. stories, the old stories about Papa Tuanuku and Maui. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be contemptuous or, or, or mock, mocking at the moment. I'm just thinking... How few, yeah. how many people are there in New Zealand who believe in the literal truth of those stories? Well, and and so for me, those are myths, and I, I think myth myth has its own grandeur and its own interest and its own uh, sure. ma majesty. 
but that's not knowledge, right? Because knowledge is justified true belief. That's more sort of culture. So I think that's an accurate observation. But we can dig it a little bit deeper into the the background of two different cultures and and see what the problem really is. I, I mean, one of the ways I think about this, if we look at the history of Western thought and as we moved up to towards the the Enlightenment and people like Francis Bacon thrashing yep, out yep. what science is as we now understand it, they were building on a worldview that had separated the sacred and the profane. The, in other words, we had a material world which was increasingly beyond the jurisdiction of religious authorities to uh, regulate inquiry into. So you can yep, think about yep. Galileo being threatened with the Inquisition for, for saying that the Earth wasn't at the centre of the universe uh, and then fast forward 250 years to, to Darwin and, and he promulgated his theory of evolution, which was also uh, not popular with certain religious authorities. But by that time, there was nothing they could do about it because they'd lost the authority to uh, to censure him or threaten him yeah, directly. Yeah, you could argue that that's, uh, there's a very similar... Pro or the exact opposite process ha happens in the Islamic world. So, you know, in the Abbasid Caliphate, especially in Baghdad, it's the 9th, 10th centuries, you have all these people doing great work in optics, for example. And, you know, Islam is by far the most advanced medical culture. And then by the time of the Ottomans, it seems like the clerics have sort of taken over. Yeah. And there's this yeah, new yeah. form of Islam in which it's constantly reiterated that if you read the books of the Europeans, you know, you're going to fall off the path of true piety. And, I mean, the Christians tried that themselves in the Middle Ages, right? And, so yes. just, and then they, you can see these two strategies, these two great cultures pursuing slightly different strategies, the West becoming more and more open and more secularized with regard to uh, empirical research, and Islam basically having a fiat on even things like astronomy, and, um, and they fall behind. And then, the, you know, even in terms of military performance, they fall behind. The Ottoman Empire gets increasingly kind of um, dismembered by the West. Yeah, and, and I think as well we can see the costs to some extent of the secularization of our society. I, I think this is possibly, possibly a larger topic than we want to go deeply into today, but here is where I would give mythology its due. I, I mean, I think these stories are beautiful. I think they're powerful. I, th I think that taken together as a, a kind of way of symbolically understanding who we are as human beings, that they can invest a great deal of meaning into life. But I also think that, you know, there's ultimately the ability to study the natural world in and of itself without any beliefs being sacred or protected from investigation or falsification with some fairly strong strictures around what counts as a scientific theory we must be able to falsify it or we must conceive of situations in which it would be falsified, yeah. uh, has led to not only absolutely incredible knowledge about the world, the like of which we could not have imagined even 150 years ago, uh, it's also led to human prosperity. It's led to a democratization of our societies or contributed to that. And so I think that we we dilute that at our very great peril. Agreed. Um, and, you, you know, uh, this notion of mana orite, I don't know what, what your, your take on this is, Michael, but I, I have concerns about it. Equal status of for any kind of traditional knowledge with world science, I find this deeply disturbing, quite frankly. Well, I, I think it's just a, um, a slogan. I, I don't think you can legislate status of, of cultural phenomena. In the no, end, but, people will hold them in the esteem in which they hold them. You can't say everybody must hold this in higher esteem. It doesn't work. People, but, people will believe what they believe. But if you force it into, into every element of a curriculum, then, then that's concerning. Well, actually, we, I agree, agree it's concerning. One of the possible effects is that uh, it's counterproductive to the to the status of, or the manner of, of Mataranga Māori, because if you attempt to shoehorn it into science where, where it really doesn't fit, especially the more mystical side, uh, you, you run a risk of it being ridiculed. 
Absolutely. And as I say, any any form of traditional knowledge has scientific elements. By all means, teach them and raise them in your in science class and early secondary and, and uh, education and so forth and teach the other elements within social studies or history or, or whatever. But don't pretend that it is science, because what is it that characterizes science, characterizes science in the modern age? Well, a lot of things things characterize science, um, not the least of which is very advanced levels of education, where typically the PhD is the gold standard. Other gold standards, of course, include a very intensive peer review, followed by publication in internationally reputed journals, uh, collaboration, cooperation within institutions, across institutions, collaboration across nations. So this is what characterizes science in the modern age. Now, what happened three or 500 years ago across different communities scattered across the world, that was good for what they had, for the resources that they had. They learned about their ecosystems. They knew how to catch and, and cook food, prepare food, uh, create shelters, navigate, predict the weather. They knew about the flora and fauna of, the, of their environments. And what their local knowledge obviously was critical to their survival. And, and uh, I know I took my, my kid four or five years ago to the, the outback of the Northern Territories. The three of us, James, you, me, uh, and Michael, if we are helicoptered into the Northern Territories, how long have we survived? But the Aboriginals- About there, 10 minutes. Yeah, well, if we're lucky. But you see, but, but then we have this juxtaposition. Uh, and this is where we, we had a, a very serious issue, not quite two years ago, when those seven professors went online uh, and 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 uh, out into the public domain with that was a 300 word uh, letter, I have to say that I agree with the sentiments of that letter. I thought that those professors were actually very accommodating and said positive things about traditional knowledge. Um, uh, they said that it's critical for the preservation and perpetuation of culture and local practices. Play key plays key roles in management and policy, uh, and uh, you know. So I don't think that there was anything particularly contentious or racist. But what w worried me and many people was the extremely negative, shrill reaction of not only elements of the general public, public, but also from a number of their colleagues. Uh, I don't understand where that's coming from. Maybe it's some kind of social justice agenda or euphoria, but surely we should have kept our perspective and been fair with these seven professors. They yeah. advanced and their also views. also in terms of the, you know, the, what the Royal Society did, and yeah. which was to investigate the, some of those well, but, but to be fair to the Royal Society, though, James, I, I've spoken to them, and they said to me, you know, and I, I accept this, that once complaints, once, once issues had been ra raised in relation to that particular letter, and some of the fellows who may or may not have been involved with that letter, they were then obligated to investigate it robustly. Yes, that's, I, that's I, their I, claim. I, 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 thank you for raising that because, yeah, that is good to get their side of the story in. I mean, from, from my perspective, the idea that, I mean, I don't know what the complaint said. I, I suspect or I think I remember that they made claims that harm was done to people by the words the professors used. And I think that if you're a scientific institution, you're taking taxpayer money to defend and, and further science. And someone comes at you with a complaint that scientists' words are hurting, uh, and you want that that complaint to be taken seriously. I think that that complaint should be dismissed out of hand because that just completely misunderstands the nature of science. I mean, I think what what you did a few minutes ago was a, was a really good description of modern Western scientific institutions. But I think um, you'd probably agree that this other things that are going on in science, and one of them, maybe even the soul of of science, is the spirit of criticism and the spirit of debate. So yeah. I think anything that really threatens to shut that down is really anathema to science. So that's why I think that the Royal Society didn't behave well, even in entertaining th these complaints. Well, they felt <laughs> that they had to do it, that they were obligated. And I I'm willing to accept that. In the end, there was an investigation, was it, of two of their fellows? Well, there was, it, it started off three, but Cobalus died before it got yes, very I far. Yes, I know, I know that. Yeah, and they yeah, did drop yeah. them eventually, although it's arguable that they dropped them only after there was an international outrage. Yeah. Uh, you know, joined by its limb leading scientists like Richard Dawkins. Yes. Well, you know, I, I felt that there was nothing particularly contentious. Uh, and, you know, the professors did say that they had a, a very severe word limit 
Um, so it may have been a mistake to to treat that topic in so few words. I, I mean, if they may, if they erred, perhaps it was in being so brief, and it would have. Well, been... they were told to in order to publish in the Listener, they were given that word limit. Right, but they could have, they could have published at least a column for the New Zealand Herald, perhaps. Well, I mean, it. but I think that I think there's a danger in sort of applying a double standard here because you can go on on Twitter or any social media site and you can find sort of you know, 10 word statements by any number of academics True. on controversial issues. I mean, it's you're just, right. But, and they don't get in trouble. No one says you should have unpacked this more, you know, and gets at them in that way unless they come. I have, I have no direction. argument with that. Um, I'm, I guess my, my point is that, uh, well, Twitter isn't a very high bar when it comes to scholarly debate. And, and <laughs> perhaps, I mean, I, I, mean I, I agree as well, David. I mean, I largely agree what the, with what they had to say. I, I just you know, with hindsight, it may have been better to develop the argument a bit more. And certainly the response to them was very unfortunate. It was <clears throat> strongly ad hominem, uh, and it effectively ended before it began something that could have been a productive conversation for, for New Zealanders yeah. to have. And um, You see, I think in the last five years in particular, it's probably been going on for longer, we've become adept at applying labels, particularly negative labels, on people who don't agree with us. Uh, there are all sorts of labels, but some of the labels applied for on, on these professors, I felt were very unfair. The label of of colonialism, uh, that what they are, what that their uh, views on science vis-a-vis uh, -vis traditional knowledge um, is, are an embodiment of racism and colonialism, and that these individual researchers were guilty of racism. I yeah. think that those labels have been very damaging. Right, I was gonna... and, and I there seemed to me to have been a, an, a, an effort to actually hurt them professionally and reputationally. And I think that that was very wrong. Yes, I mean, Michael and I published an article a while ago after speaking to some of the people who were involved. And there were some things that didn't come out in the mainstream media. I don't know why. For example, a professor at Auckland claims that he was taken off his first year classes. And yeah. um, someone tried to get him, uh, I believe, banned from the building because on the basis of the belief that he was harming you know, actively harming Maori students. And then a former student of the same professor uh, got a phone call from somebody saying, uh, you know, she, the, the, they were advising her to think about the relationship with this professor on the, on the grounds that this was perpetuating harm. So this idea that ideas perpetuate harm, I mean, it, it seems, uh, you know, not that crazy when you state it like that, but it has mm -hmm. these knock-on effects that you start you start reacting to ideas like they're actual violence and, mm. and then you're shutting people down just for writing a letter, which to my mind is a just absurd thing that we, I thought we got past uh, in the Enlightenment. I like, I like um, Jonathan Ayling's take on this, Jonathan being the, the chief executive of the Free Speech Union. He, he'll say, well, yes, ideas can cause harm, but not as much harm as suppressing them. Yeah. There is also a thing called bullying, isn't there? <clears throat> and in the academic environment, you might have thought that up till recently, whatever bullying was taking place would have been per perpetuated by middle class white senior academics of bullying other staff and bullying students and you name it. But actually, the, the grounds have shifted recently and bullying now can actually go in, and, and probably does more often go in the other direction. If you are a, a member of a minority group or a female or a, a, a minority female, you can essentially harass a white middle class academic knowing that there will be a groundswell of support for you, not only amongst your peers, but actually within the university administration. And actually, I felt that those academics at, at the university, that are Auckland University, were actually at risk. And that what they were at risk of was actually a form of bullying. Well, I'll say, David, that when you were talking about them being labeled racist and colonialist, I almost stopped you and said, oh, no, to be fair, the, the initial uh, letter signed by some 2,000 New Zealand academics, um, the lead authors of which were Wiles and Hendy, I yeah. can't remember whether that labeled them racist or whether it just said that science was racist. However, I thought about it a little bit more as you were speaking, and we actually have just come across an example where the, the, the authors of the, liter, uh, of the listener letter were labeled racist, and that's in Tara McAllister's article. Yeah, and she very course. much says, you know, number one is, there are, no, the number one reason why there are not Maori in your science department is because of these seven people. And number two is because the, because you're racist. So it seems to link the two. And what I have heard from talking to many academics is that they feel suppressed. If they speak out, they are at risk of their jobs. And I'll tell you who else doesn't want to speak out. There is another uh, community 
um, that is reluctant to speak out. And I'm referring now to our secondary schools and to our secondary teachers. And I have spoken to many of them. And I know that many teachers, particularly science teachers, certainly in the, in the Wellington secondary schools, are not happy with the new curriculum. I know that that there are university, sorry, the, the school administrations are not happy, but they feel that they can't speak out. Yeah, and that's something that you know we've experienced too, and uh, just talking to other people. And I think to some extent, while we're, I'm still part time at the university, and I feel it to some extent. I, I'm pretty sure Michael did when he was, when he was there. Uh, but it's also something that we've done some, you know, work on trying to find the actual evidence because it may be, of course, you know, this is a good point about science as well. It may be that we're biased in some way. We're we're more liable to think that there's a free speech crisis when there really isn't. But um, a paper we published uh, last year with colleagues in the Heterodox New Zealand group, which is a branch of Heterodox Academy, which is an international organization of scholars concerned with you know viewpoint diversity and free speech in universities. And we just surveyed, we did a big survey of students at uh, mainly from three different New Zealand universities. And, um, and a similar survey was done of staff by the Free Speech Union. And both of those surveys basically came out with the same conclusion that um, you know, a good proportion of staff and students at New Zealand universities feel constrained in their speech. You know, they feel they can't, staff feel they can't talk about particular issues, especially the Treaty of Waitangi. Over, over half of them said they felt more constrained than free to discuss the Treaty of Waitangi. And when it comes to students, uh, the, the usual kind of uh, subjects and themes, the usual topics of uh, sexuality and sex and mm -hmm. race and um, gender, those things that a lot of people felt more constrained uh, than you, th th than free to discuss those things in the classroom. So there's yeah. there's also oh, good yeah. scientific evidence now. I think that this is. No, this I, is I, I I agree with that. I think you've got to be now very very careful what you say. And another angle on this, of course, is the New Zealand media. And I've heard lots of people say, well, you know, the media is in is captured, is captured by government and so forth, and that. Um, we see only one side of a particular debate, what we might call a progressive left side. At first, I didn't take it seriously, but quite frankly, I've been looking very carefully at, at our New Zealand online and paper media, and now I can see it. It absolutely is the case. An avalanche of stuff that comes out, you know, opinion pieces and journal articles with one particular worldview, and the countermanding, the countervailing worldview has very little exposure. Sometimes you get the odd article here and there, but very little exposure. And I think this is a dangerous situation. Yeah, and that's, uh, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I also agree that I, I resisted this conclusion for a really long time because I think you start to sound a bit crazy if you think, oh, the main, you start railing against the mainstream media. You know, only five or 10 years ago, I would have thought, oh, the mainstream media is fine. And, um, you know, I think that sometimes they succeed in putting an alternative viewpoint, but but often they don't. And I think especially on these big issues, and that's, that's quite troubling to me as well. But I mean, this is again, this is why we're doing free Kiwis because we want to get other voices, uh, you know, we're going to open the field to other voices and other views. And so with, we thank you very much for what you said today and also for your really, really detailed and careful and thorough article, which I encourage everybody to, to go read. And we're going to put a link to it at the bottom. So thanks very much, David. Thanks for coming. Thank you, thank you James, and thank you, Michael.